insider trading is not the most serious crime in the history of the world. They got outsized attention when our office brought them. Uh, the most insider trading cases in the most significant uh, uh, circumstances in more than one generation in the Southern District of New York. And people would say to me, why are you so obsessed with insider trading, Preet? And I said, I'm not, you are, because there's a huge financial press. There's 24 hour uh, financial news channels. There's not a 24 hour narcotics channel or gangs channel or homicide channel um, other than fiction. And people are endlessly fascinated by rich people, billionaires who take a fall. There's a reason why there's a, sh a show on, on a television show on Showtime called Billions. And I would say we had a handful of people working on insider trading cases, like we had a handful of people working on corruption cases, a handful of people working on cyber, always a handful of people, extraordinary, excellent, amazing prosecutors got outsized attention. So on the one hand, you know, it was not homicide, murder, it was not terrorism. But on the other hand, it was still important because there's a view among the general public that the system is rigged, that it's unfair. People have advantages that they use uh, and privilege that, you know, don't comport with what the system is supposed to be like. And if people can't believe in the fairness and integrity of the markets, they lose faith in, in the integrity and fairness of the markets. Insider trading is a little bit of an odd crime to prosecute because there's no identifiable victim. Although I would say, imagine you're, uh, you know, a, in the C-suite, you're an executive at a publicly traded company and you're selling information about the company, ask the CEO of the company if they think they're not a victim of that crime. And then of course the whole, the whole market is a victim as well. So I thought they were important to prosecute. It was important to show people that it didn't matter how big you were, how powerful you were, how, how uh, rich you were, that you were not beyond the reach of the law. You're not above the law. And that was true with Roger Rutnam. That was true with Rajat Gupta. Um, I mean, there are a million things I can tell you about those cases. So I don't know in particular what you're interested in. Um, for me personally, it was a bit odd because I got a lot of criticism because those two gentlemen happened to be South Asian and by happenstance and coincidence, um, I'm from South Asia. And so it, it got a lot of additional attention, particularly in India for that reason, which I thought was very odd. Um, somebody wrote in the Wall Street Journal, I'll never forget this, the opening line of the Wall Street Journal said something like, you know, the, the, def the defendant, the target, Roger Rajaratnam, hails from South Asia, he's from Sri Lanka, and lo and behold, the prosecutor also hails from South Asia, he was born in India, as if that was such a dramatic, crazy thing. And I remember thinking, and you'll appreciate this, y you know where South Asians prosecute South Asians every day and no one blinks an eye? India. <laughs> right? right? It happens all the time. No one says, oh my God, there's a Jewish prosecutor prosecuting a Jewish defendant. Oh my God, that's crazy. How could that possibly happen? It's insanity that that was focused on. Also, by the way, Roger Rutnam was, was charged, was indicted because he was about to travel in October of 2009. I took office in August of 2009. All the wiretaps that ended up convicting Roger Rutnam uh, were done and authorized by my Latino predecessor, who was not going out of his way to prosecute Indian people. I inherited that case. I inherited the Gupta case from other people. So I'm not sure what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to come into office and say, oh, you know what? I know that you have overwhelming evidence. Another recommendation is that we should indict Roger Ruttam and Roger Gupta. But you know what? My parents told me don't prosecute <laughs> Indians. So I'm sorry, we cannot, we cannot. I mean, so the criticism in that regard, I don't mean to make light was kind of crazy to me. I, I really didn't understand it. I'm right, <laughs> June, I, I, you know, I don't know what to say beyond that. I, I guess the other thing I'll say is that's, that's interesting. Apart from the- Yeah, I don't know. I didn't, I, whenever there were Korean Americans, I said, we can't prosecute this guy. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it, got, it got to be, it got to the point where people will come into my, remember, I'm not prosecuting the case. Like I'm not, this is not false humility. You know, people don't, I, Preet Bharara, the United States Attorney, I'm the boss, right? I'm not going to, to court and getting the wiretap authorizations. It's a lot of white people who are not trying to persecute Indians just because I happen to be at the top of the office who make the recommendations about the case. And I'm not going to say, well, my dad's gonna be upset, so no. But the other thing I would say is, 
What's extraordinary about those kinds of crimes, Gupta and Rajaratnam, and maybe you have, you have from time to time clients like this, they were already rich, legitimately, right? Rajaratnam was a billionaire. And we were concerned, I write about this a little bit in, in the book, we were concerned about the defense, which was going to be, look, we have all this evidence that these trades that were made were based on legitimate research and legitimate homework. And we were, we were thinking, well, how, how are we gonna counteract that argument? Because, and this is an argument that a lot of you know, rich and, and, and well-funded defendants use. Why on earth would I commit that crime? I already have a billion dollars and I made it all legitimately. Why, why would I engage in this $20 million fraud? I have a billion, more money than you can spend in a lifetime. And then you realize there are people in the world who cheat. And the phrase we came up with, that someone came up with to use at the trial, was, yeah, you know what? They did their homework, but they cheated too, right? And you'll find that, you know, I don't know how much people follow um, baseball in the United States, and maybe you have these kinds of scandals in cricket, but there have been prominent baseball players in the United States who took steroids so they could game the system and they could improve their performance. And you know the people who took the steroids? It was not the, the, the terrible player. It was not the bottom player. It was the player who was already great, who already was a record holder, Barry Bonds and others, who were already extraordinary baseball players. And they wanted a little bit more. They wanted a little bit extra. So they juiced themselves, they took steroids, and we compared insider trading on the part of these people to that. And in the case of Roger Gupta, who I know, who I, you should not read his book, um, which I know was a little bit popular in India, where uh, most of what he does is complain and whine about the treatment he got. He got off light, in fact, ruined his reputation, proof beyond a reasonable doubt by a jury of his peers in the United States. He had $100 million. And my armchair psychology about Rajat Gupta, who does a lot of talking about other people's psychology, including mine, is that he saw Rajat Gupta, who was not as smart, who was not as erudite, who was not as prominent, who was not as famous, who was not as lauded, who was not as um, not a recipient of as many awards. And my guess is he thought to himself, how come I only have $100 million? And Raj Rajaratnam, who is uncouth and is not me, how does he have a billion dollars? And even people who have extraordinary wealth and extraordinary accomp accomplishment can become envious of other people. And that is sometimes what causes them to commit their crimes. I don't understand it, but that's the best explanation I can give.